So I just want to introduce myself. I'm Bridget Maher. I'm director of the Film and Media Arts Division and the School of Communication at American <laughs> University. Thank you so much for attending our session um, entitled Virtual and Augmented Reality in Teaching and Scholarship. This is an area that is not new to AU, but definitely emerging. And so you can see here a mix of both um, uh, seasoned and incoming faculty who are engaged in this scholarship and teaching. I'm going to be your moderator today, and what I will do is just give some brief introductions of our esteemed faculty. Um, then they're going to give their own presentations, and we're going to open it up to Q&A. If you don't mind, I will be my best in briefness as an academic, um, and just do some brief uh, introductions. So, to my right here is Professor Shapiro, who is the Professor of Psychology and former Chair of the Computer Science and member of the um, Center for Behavioral Neuroscience. His research focuses on a wide range of questions related to how the brain constructs our perceptual world and has won many international awards for the visual illusions that he has created. He is co-editor of the Oxford Compendium of Visual Illusions 2017 and has been affiliated with Nat Geo Brain Games and is the presenter for two seasons of shows on visual illusions produced by CuriosityStream.com. Um, over to my far right is Mark Tra Mike Trainer. if you can just, yeah, thank you. Mike Trainer is Assistant Professor of Computer Science and a founding member of American University Game Lab. We're hoping he'll be associate soon. His research is broadly aimed at finding, I'm just putting that out there to get the good mojo going. Tell your friends. His research is broadly aimed at finding new approaches for interpretation and expression within video games and computational media. He's had work nominated for technical excellence at the Independent Games Festival and Indicate, and the scholarship is primarily about video game interpretation, tools for game creation, social simulation, and procedural content generation. He holds an MFA in digital <coughs> art and media and a PhD in computer science from UC Santa Cruz. I can say that because I'm from the West Coast, so I can show That's you. cool. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, yeah. right on. Close <laughs> Um and I, please forgive me because I should have asked how to pronounce your name ahead of time. And my children speak Mandarin, so I'm uh, Bei Xiao. Xiao. Mm -hmm. Xiao. Now you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. I'm trying. I'm corrected daily, I assure you. Um, is an assistant professor in Department of Computer Science and the head of Visual Intelligence Laboratory at American University. She received her PhD from University of Pennsylvania in Neuroscience and postdoctoral training at Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. Her research centers on human color perception, material perception, computer vision, perception-driven graphics, tactile perception, and VR, virtual reality. Recently, she has been working on human and machine inter interference and material properties of deformable objects and dynamic scenes using psychophysics, crowdsourcing, and deep learning methods, and currently, she is also working on multisensory rendering and perception of material properties in VR, AR. Larry Engel, um, who's in the middle here, is an Emmy Award, Professor Engel is an Emmy Award winning producer, writer, director, and cinematographer in his fifth decade of filmmaking that spans all seven continents. He's worked on over 250 projects for domestic and international broadcasters <coughs> and cable channels. His career started in photography, then moved to film. Currently, Professor Engel is associate professor at American University's SOC and associate director for the Center for Environmental Filmmaking. Filmmaker in residence with the Investigative Reporting Workshop, he is affiliate faculty member with Center for Latino and Latin American Studies, SIS Global Environmental Politics Program. He just had a session on um, interdisciplinary research, research, and this bio absolutely reflects <laughs> that. He teaches media production and theory and history, several courses um, in the field, including practice for environmental um, environmentalism. Um, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, for yeah. time, abbreviate because. Sure. With of over course. five decades of experience in seven continents, you have quite the bio. A three-part series that he directed and shot, The Human Spark, hosted by Alan Aldo, premiered on PBS National and won prestigious AAS Cavalry Science Journalism Award for in-depth journalism. His short film, Potato Heads, Keepers of Crop, premiered at the Washington, D.C. Environmental Film Festival and screened at two festivals in Italy and <coughs> in Australia. Um, now, it's fun. And yeah. so last but not least, we have Professor Christoph um, Petroschek. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Neither name is pronounceable. We need to get our phonetics. Uh, this is a good, uh, you know, unique idea on Google. 
<laughs> you know, this is embarrassing because I'm actually teaching our teaching seminar in FMA, and one of the things we should be prepared for is to be able to exactly. show the respect that you all are entitled to in terms of being respectful of your name. So I apologize. No worries. Um, so we're really excited to have Christoph. He's this is his first year in film and media arts, and he is our dedicated VR AR professor and is developing out our curriculum. Um, he is a Polish-Canadian filmmaker, game designer, and computer scientist. Um, he is assistant professor in the Film and Media Arts Division um, and interim program director of the graduate game program at AU Game Lab. He received his MFA in film from York University, MA in comm studies from Wilfrid Lohr University, and PhD in computer science from the University of Waterloo. His research and art projects involve persuasive virtual and augmented reality, games for change, human computer interaction, and volumetric filmmaking. He's going to give a brief introduction of um, our game lab here on campus and the people that participate and work within it. Yes, thank you, Bridget. I have Thanks, Bridget. I have to click through it there. I have like a, a strange setup here. So I will be turning this way. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to acknowledge everybody working in the Game Lab. Uh, game Lab is a uh, internationally recognized hub uh, of innovation in game design. Especially, we work with uh, in games uh, for change and um, uh, engagement design. And there is many other faculty. Uh, some of them actually work in VR, AR. For example, uh, Ben Stokes uh, works on um, uh, Playful Cities projects, which involve. Uh, uh, augmented reality. So this is not all which uh, AU has, of, uh, has to offer in terms of the VR and AR. We also have very active adjuncts and visiting scholars, which is not typical for adjuncts to do research, but uh, ours actually do. Uh, Samara Fanti and um, Akash Vashishta, they are both working on, on some VR projects uh, with me. And we have amazing visiting scholars. For example, Luol Mayen just got the equivalent of um, Oscar in uh, games, which is called the Games Award like the Games Award, uh, so we are very lucky to have amazing, uh, a amazing, very active lab. So I wanted to start this presentation with giving you, um, and to spark up the discussion kind of, to, to steam up the discussion. I want to disagree with the title of the, uh, the panel, which I proposed actually, <laughs> which is basically um, the terminology mix up, uh, mix up um, I think. Uh, we use the term virtual and augmented reality which kind of suggests, especially to people who don't have that much experience with it, that these are two different technologies. But in fact, virtual and augmented reality is just part of a spectrum of augmented reality to a certain degree. <laughs> so we should think about it as a way of adding something to reality, not as uh, just having two different technologies somehow related to computer science. Okay, so this was uh, actually, a ta the taxonomy of that was invented or was proposed by Milgram and Kishner in 1994. It was the early, the second wave of, of, of the VR, which kind of failed because the technology was not yet there. And basically what it means is that if we think about reality as, as such, if you believe that this is real, that's a philosophical question too, <laughs> you, can, you can start augmenting it with a perceptual stimuli which is artificially generated, that's the name artificial reality, and it doesn't have to be actually only visual or, or audio. It can be any kind of um, uh, perceptual stimuli. It can be uh, smell, taste. It can be um, uh, vestibular stimuli, uh, so the, the feeling of movement. Uh, and this augmentation can, can go to a certain degree. And there are different categories you can think of. The first one is augmented reality, actually. So it is when, let's say, I create a dinosaur hologram, which I do daily. Here we have dinosaur holograms walking in, in the uh, game lab, if you want to check them. They don't bite because they're made of light. Uh, so if I just create this dinosaur and it will go walk through here, okay, it will just go from here to there, ignoring the fact that you are here, then this is called augmented reality. If we add to that uh, the ability to hide for the dinosaur, to hide under the table or walk around, that will be the mixed reality when the physical environment ad, uh, um, influences how the uh, holograms are interacting with the world. Now, <laughs> if we take over this classroom and turn it into a, a Jurassic uh, a jungle and put some dinosaurs there, and uh, this will be uh, augmented virtuality. But what that means is that every physical object in this room will turn into some other physical object in the virtual reality. So for example, this table could become a rock, in, or uh, this wall can become an impenetrable jungle, um, um, uh, uh, jungle wall of, of uh, uh, trees. 
Uh, so that's aug uh, augmented virtuality. And finally, if we just ignore the reality and replace it with virtual reality, such that, for example, I make a pathway here, but if I start to walk it, I will bump into a physical object in the reality, this is virtual reality, okay? So it's good to think about it this way because it's not uh, just uh, these two distinct technologies. It's basically a spectrum of augmenting what we perceive. Uh, the inventor of uh, the virtual reality, Ivan Sutherland, actually named it very nicely. He said that VR, AR could, and this was, he said could because it was 1968, could literally be the wonderland into which Alice walked. By which he meant it is a indistinguishable, in a long term, indistinguishable creation from reality. It's, it's a set of perceptual stimuli which you can't differentiate. So how do you actually enter the virtual world? Well, there is many ways, and uh, they become more and more accessible. The most accessible way is to use your smartphone uh, and $5 Google Cardboard. It's not the best, the most uh, enjoyable way, but it is a good start if you want to just try to see what it is. So you just put your smart uh, smartphone into a uh, Google Cardboard, and, and that's it. And uh, the most ad advanced right now ways, a way of doing it is to have a rucksack and a headset, which we have, by the way, we, you can try it in the game lab, and basically walk around in this rucksack completely isolated from the environment. Uh, there is also a new te technology that has come um, uh, about right now, for example, the Magic Leap. It's a AR technology which gives you the, these holograms uh, which walk around, like the dinosaurs I'm speaking about. And there is also a kind of the exhibition-based or, or location-based VR, which is the caves and the um, um, holodecks which are created uh, by projection um, technologies. And this thing in the middle which looks very weird, it's a prototype of a thing which will this, well, it will remove all of these things uh, in the long term which is the retina projection. So in the long term what I imagine, I think it will happen, is that there will be no technology. The technology will be ambient, so the te technology will be there but it will be hidden and we will just see these images projected directly on our retina from some distance. For example, there will be a little projector somewhere in the corner of a room and you can move yourself into another dimension this way instead of having these bulky, funny looking uh, uh, headsets. Applications on, of VR and AR are endless. There is, uh, it, it's, it's hard to find a field where it will not have impact. Um, the obvious ones are, for example, virtual tourism, entertainment, 360 videos. Uh, we do volumetric films, which is like a holodeck experience where you walk inside the film. Um, but there is also experiments with a uh, live theater. And there is a lot of uh, science and, and industrial ex uh, experiences and projects, for example, remote surgery or exploring a tumor before you actually cut it as a, as a surgeon, very popular uh, right now. A lot of educational uh, engagement. There is a very, very interesting projects in exercise, uh, Excel games. So when you exercise, instead of just doing this on a gym, you can enter some world and you know run out, uh, run away from a dinosaur or a zombie, which makes you run faster for longer, right? Things like that. Uh, there are experiments uh, with it already. It's not that every gym has it, but it will happen. Uh, for example, the, this this um, exercise bike was just announced by one of the big companies, which will have a VR headset embedded in it. So what we do uh, as a, a game lab, we actually have a part called VR Lab. It's a, it's a room dedicated for VR, which I'm uh, working with a, a number of students, I will mention soon. And one of the projects which we are working on is, this is an example related to this panel, uh, is a project of an engagement design with an ancient um, um, culture of Mesopotamia. So. Um, Quite recently, we found um, um, a cuneiform tablet which tell us how the famous royal game of Ur was played. Anybody heard about the, ro the royal game of Ur? It's the oldest board game, um, one of the oldest board games, but we didn't know the rules of it. Some very um, patient uh, British museum uh, uh, professor worked through 130,000 uh, cuneiform tablets and found the rules. So now we know the rules. <laughs> but what we did, yes, he did the hard work. But what we did, we, we basically implemented that game in VR. And why in VR? Because we <laughs> want people who play that game to be in the ancient Mesopotamia when playing that game. And they are playing against the Sargon of Akka, which is one of the rulers of the uh, Akkadian Empire from this period. So here is a quick overview of how it looks like. It will be a little bit dark, I'm, I'm afraid, but hopefully you can see it. Oh, and we don't have sound. Oh, we have. Okay. 
So, yeah, you can't see it. <laughs> uh, so it's basically a reconstruction of one of the um, tombs uh, in, in the city of Ur. And uh, then a figure of Sargon of Akkad comes in and you play against him in VR. This is your hands, so you actually use your hands and they are visualized in, in VR uh, to play against them. So this is just a prototype, but it's an example of how you can turn some historical uh, knowledge into engagement and, and, and engaging game. Another project I wanted to show is a prototype uh, of a system which allows people in a remote places uh, participate in any classroom. So let's say we are running this session right now, it's a class. Uh, it is enough for me to just broadcast my voice through, let's say, my laptop or any, any kind of way, uh, YouTube channel, uh, to be able to um, uh, create a virtual reality system in which I am represented as a uh, avatar and students can join this class virtually and they will be represented as avatars on the screen. So this is a quick prototype of one of the uh, projects which we call university, which will show you what, what, what actually happens. Right. Uh, this equation has so you see a teacher here asking a student. The student on the bottom is a virtual representation of the student and the actual student is somewhere else in the lab she can write on the whiteboard. The, the teacher sees her writing on the whiteboard, and he can interact with her, telling her that she's making a mistake in this formula. This is actually a famous formula in uh, human-computer interaction. Okay, that's pretty close. Now, and the, the teacher is represented as an avatar, so when he moves, the, the avatar moves. <laughs> this is also a prototype, but we are working on making it better. It's a very interesting uh, field of research to make generative animations. Uh, which look very realistic. And as you can see, they are not yet that realistic here, but they will be. And the final project is probably the most fun. It's intended to be funny, so don't think I was trying to be serious here. It is funny, uh, it, partially because it is not yet that good, but it's <laughs> interesting. So the idea here is that uh, you can teach virtual uh, actors to perform a certain scene. And I'm a director, so I work with actors, I thought, hmm, how about making a perfect actor who always listens to directions, never complains, <laughs> <laughs> stop it during the show. That's like, that will, oh, okay, I love actors, so I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, but here, this is an artificial intelligence actor that learns how to perform uh, Hamlet. <laughs> Okay, Adam, listen. Um, today we are going to work on the famous monologue by Shakespeare from Hamlet. For now, let's just do a dry run of this scene. Action! To be. Or not to be. That is the question. But it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of our greatest fortune. Stop. Okay, so that was fine. But now I would like you to interpret this text, add some movement, create choreography. Let's see what you can do. Action. To be. Or not. But it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Okay, stop. Uh, honestly, it looked like you were scared, and the <laughs> text is about being sad, making a very difficult decision. So let me show you, or maybe let's ask John to show you the movement, the choreography I imagined for this scene. I cut it a little bit shorter, it's choppy, but you know, this is a student showing the choreography to the actor, and the actor is, the virtual actor is learning that choreography from the, from the student, who is wearing a special suit to actually record the movement. Okay, Adam, so now you learn the movement, and uh, I would like to see your final interpretation. Let's actually switch on the decoration, and switch on the set lighting, and spotlight off. 
action. To be or not to be. That is the question. But it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of our greatest fortune. Or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing. Stop. That was pretty good. <laughs> okay, let's finish for today. <laughs> that was pretty good as for the virtual actor. <laughs> so I wanted to just uh, as the, at the end acknowledge all the students and um, uh, adjuncts who work uh, in the VR lab uh, with me. There's uh, so many that I don't have time to list all the names, but there are also undergraduate students, which is interesting. We're engaging undergraduate students. And also we have one student, which is actually um, a Bay, Bay student who works uh, with us on the AR chess project, so I included her. Uh, she's a PhD student in uh, neuroscience, but actually she's a student of, of Bay. She just worked on, on one project with us. Uh, without help of the students, this would not be possible. These projects are uh, ongoing and, and done by, uh, by them. Actually, we have some of them. Adam is here. Adam is working on the university project. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, and Carlos is here too. Oh, yeah, right. He's working with me on a volumetric project. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, let's go to the next presenter. Okay, so uh, my talk is just going to be a little uh, biographical and opposite of the future um, uh, of VR and games. Uh, but first, a bit of a funny joke. So this is a picture of, it looks just like me as a kid. This is what virtual reality was to me. Anyone remember this kind of thing? You pay like five dollars and maybe shoot something. Uh, and it maybe look like that inside there. Sort of cool, but th it was a massive piece of equipment, right? That only like an amusement park could afford, right? And so then came this thing. Anyone have one of these? The virtual Boy? Yeah. yeah. Games. So this was this kind of silly game console where you'd put your face into it, um, and they re the only released like eight games because it was such a colossal um, commercial failure. Um, and, but you know, you play like tennis with Mario, the ball would kind of look like it went away and closer. You know, I think it's underrated. Uh, there's actually a great book that does deep analysis of these things. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is what VR was to me. Um, and then, you know, my life went on and uh, I got really inspired by another area of VR that was going on pretty much at the same time, but in more academic and art circles. So this is a screenshot from um, Char Davies' Osmos. Um, and so Char Davies was a traditional painter in the 80s who did landscapes and this sort of thing. And then she was really interested in, she's like, okay, we're recreating reality, but you know, our lives are immersed in technology. So she wanted to make these works where you are so immersed in the artificial, but reflecting on uh, the real world, right? And so this VR was where she ended up going and she made these really great works and she did other Great works. So this was uh, introduced me to the idea of virtual reality as a medium for expression, and this was very inspirational. Uh, so it helped inform my MFA project. Uh, however, it was near impossible to make VR work at the time, um, as th that's been changing. So, but here, my um, this is one of my first games called Reflect. In this game, uh, you looked through the perspective of various animals, and the goal was to defamiliarize the environment. You're just like staring at these like bizarre, like pixelated, that's like brush in the right sort of. Um, and the idea is just to uh, essentially get this tranquil engagement with a um, artificial environment. And it would have been awesome for VR. I wanted it to be in VR. I even prototyped the thing with like real cameras and would watch the videos and all this. But you know, at the time, like VR to me would have been like this, like some weird bunch of wires and junk and cardboard things to my face, a bunch of code maybe I didn't understand all that well. And so I just pretty much gave up, it was impossible. Um, however, oh, anyway, so I, I stuck with screen-based media, made a career, work here at the game lab, do social simulation, et cetera. Um, however, I am super pumped about what's going on with VR right now. Um, so I've been teaching uh, this game development class at American for several years now. Um, we are able, I have the students who come in have no programming experience, 
they learn the game engine Unity, which is very, anyone hear of Unity in here? Yeah, anyway, it's a very great game engine, one of the leading ones. Um, and if people get to create their games, but the thing I want to emphasize is that people come in, uh, you shouldn't be able to say like no previous programming and create your own games. Like that's, those things don't go together because their games are some of the biggest, most complicated pieces of engineering in the world. Um, so, but um, I would have students go, and I'm gonna show you a couple examples, who would have no programming, learn how to make games, and then they'd use these tools, one, one of them called Steam VR, which literally is almost, I mean, I'm hand waving wise, a drag and drop interface to where you can now control you know, everywhere you look, you're in your world, so if you know how to make games in the Unity game engine, you can now do that. So a couple examples. Um, Ethan Goss Alexander, um, and this is really cool, because it's like research, because it's really interested in accessibility and um, universal design, so design for everyone. So don't assume people can hold controllers. Some people have limited mobility, and he made this game. Um, I don't think I have time for videos, but um, there are videos here. <laughs> uh, where you have very simple gestures with one or two hands that limited uh, people who have a hard time controlling their fi fingers can play this cool space shooter game. It's awesome. he, he ran studies on this, and it was great. Um, and then another example, Alex Cha did his capstone project. He was one of our second cohort students. Um, and, and this game is so cool. Like, and so he really tackled the design challenges of navigation in virtual reality. So it's, it's kind of weird. There's this uh, mismatch, if you think from a design perspective, of having this complete immersion, right? And then you're in this beautiful big 3D world, but then you're moving by like using your thumbs and you're like hovering around. Okay, so you see there's like this disconnect between the sense that you are in a place but you are not using your feet. Now Christoph knows all about how, how people that have been creating walking around environment things. Um, so anyway, he made really cool design solutions where you had these hand gestures, you like swipe and you're just like flying around solving puzzles and it was great. Um, so anyway, I think the sky's the limit now and I think the tools have really matured from the beginning. So when we started, it was Relatively, I don't know, I had a computer science undergrad and I decided no way I could do this in like 2000. Um, so anyway, that's all centers around game engines like Unity, which have great interfaces. And just a crazy idea because I want to throw out there, like the, you can really just do really cool experimental stuff. So this is this great sequencer synthesizer that I've just been obsessing over recently. <laughs> and you can, it, so it's this real time interface that you can make music on the fly and it interfaces to Unity really well with a little bit of code and then so Unity with this hub, you could take some cutting edge like the Magic Leap, and now suddenly you're playing like interactive, like sequenced music, you're like waving your hands around, doing like crazy, uh, it's just, that, that's so cool, right? You can do everything and it's so much easier now. Um, so just a plug, if you or students or friends um, are scared of programming, um, I think the tools have really matured and you can jump in and take classes like game development or, uh, there's also creative coding, which is a class um, that has room in it. So if you have students who want to take a class called creative coding, I'm teaching it, it's going to be great. All right. And there's a picture of me with a virtual boy on my face. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Yes. I, I think it. Yeah. Um, Did everyone get glasses? Yeah. yeah. You don't have glasses. Just I don't even have to move. There should be, there should be a monitor up there. That's okay. So if you don't have, does anyone over here not have glasses? So, so I am in the, in the Department of Psychology and Computer Science. It's over in the fall, I teach computer science classes. I teach uh, psychology classes. Um, I'm interested in questions about reality and about illusions. And so there's two topics which I could have talked to you about. One is I have a complex problem course um, this semester called Reality, Virtual, Augmented, and Otherwise. Um, I'm going to leave that off, but the main question here, if you want to bring it up during discussion, I can talk about how I'm using various forms of augmented reality and various games involved in, in, in that course. Um, and that's that's, it's a very fun topic, but it's all about the nature of, of what reality is. Um, and the other part is part of my research, and with relation to VR and AR, what I'm interested in is what does it take to make, make a perceptual surrogate? 
So, so far we've been talking about these questions about virtual reality where you just stick some headset on your head and suddenly this three-dimensional world appears. And so the game I'm playing is, what about it allows us to do this? What is going on with the brain in order to construct this perceptual world? So typically for a perceptual surrogate, what we're doing, we think of as saying, let's take some glasses and stick them on one eye and stick them on some other, another perspective on the other eye, and suddenly three dimensions appear. Right? So it's like an artificial perceptual surrogate. Not unlike if you take artificial sweetener, right? You're putting it on your tongue and it's mimicking the senses of what the sugar should be like, right? So in some respect, when you take out your sweet and low or your aspartame, you can call it, as, as Christoph wants to call it, an artificial sweetener. But really what you have is a virtual sweetener. Oh, we've got some virtual sugar, right? And it sticks around. Avoided at all so costs. So what I'm going to talk to you about is something, uh, a, a set of set of games I've been playing with this, which just won this um, the uh, uh, best illusion of the year in Japan. There's a tenth annual thing, and, I end up, and there's you know there's, they do a top ten every year, and there's 99 Japanese, and and I entered this year and ended up with the first place one. Um, so I'm kind of proud about that. I'm going out to Japan. February to present things on this. So what I'd like you to do to see this, uh, this looks like it's out of range. Uh -huh. Is it? Uh, it should work. So what I want you, you don't have to put on both eyes. So what you're going to do is, if you have glasses, you have it holding one hand. Keep both eyes open and put one filter on so you can see it from one eye. In fact, hold it over your right eye at first, and then you will switch so that the thing is over the left eye. You know, going back and forth. If you're doing it with just the filter like this, with one eye and then this eye, right? So here it is. Uh, I need my glasses so I can see what I'm doing. So let's see. Please run. There we go. There it goes. This so, is the basic version of helix rotation. So hold it over one eye like this. Both eyes open and then place a dark filter over one eye. So if you do this, it should rotate in one direction. direction. Three dimensions. Now, now take your glasses and move it to the other eye. Filter. That's so cool, isn't it? The other eye. And the helix Does it switch, switch directions? Yes. yes. Right? So we go back and forth. If you blur the image by squinting, and if you squint, or by you'll using see the image the going up and down, or by making the image yeah, it's small, totally crazy. then one helix appears to move upwards right and the other appears to move downwards. That's amazing. This low spatial frequency information is always present yet we don't see the motion under normal conditions. All right. So what you should have gotten, did everyone get this? We put over one eye, it rotates one direction, yep. uh -huh. and the other okay. eye. So, so what this is playing with, is playing with a 100-year-old uh, effect, which is called the Pulfricht effect, which is that if you have one <laughs> eye that's darker than the other, the signal going from your eye to the brain is actually slower from the darker eye. So it's as if we, we know this. We can stick an electrode in the, in the cells going from the eye to the brain. And if you lower the light level, that signal is slower. So if you have two eyes where one's a slower signal and one's a brighter signal, then one's brighter, one's, one's going to be faster, you're going to create the perception of depth. And as an aside, this was originally done with, by someone named Pulfrich, who's a German physiologist who was recording from the cells going from the eye to the brain. And he did it with a pendulum. If you look at a pendulum that's moving back in three dimensions, you put a dark filter of one eye, the pendulum will look like it's going around in a circle. And the most amazing part about this is that Pulfrich lost one eye in the war. So he wow. never actually saw the effect, but deduced it from the physiology. Right? So I have a number of these things, but I want to stay. Uh, there we go. I'm going to stay on schedule. This one's kind of cool, and show how this works in in a, um, a a virtual environment and why we should care about it if we're in virtual environments. That over there is um, Lily and Lily's friend. Lily's over here, Lily's friend, um, who's working on working on this project. Lily Donaldson. So here's this. So what do you see? It's like a ball tornado, and there's like. Blue balls, there's red balls, like there. They're going around. And it kind of looks like a double helix with a DNA strand. Okay, Lily, move him. So 
So in the virtual reality environment, it's flat. Okay, now it's like completely flat, and it's going back and forth, and the little balls are crashing into each other. Okay, bring it back. <laughs> well, now we're back to 3D. Okay, okay, cool. Now we're going. <laughs> So the game on this, so this is kind of fun because it's like a trump loy in a trump loy environment, right? So it's, like a, it's a, an illusion based on depth in a place that's trying to create illusions of depth, right? So it's sort of a meta illusion in some respects. But it's really important because what we think is we're just placing two, two pictures on one, on one, up from one, one angle, one from the other, and the three dimensions occurs. But the visual system has a lot of ways of creating depth, and if you don't if you're not careful about it, what you do when you create a three-dimensional world is, is add three dimensions when you don't intend to. And this is a very interesting world question for a whole bunch of health-related issues and for exploration in a number of different ways. But I'm going to end on that to keep on time. And I could have a lot of questions. If there's questions if people want to talk about it, I could talk about this in a number of different ways. So, Um, so I'm a documentary filmmaker, um, and um, I'm very interested in the evolution of uh, both modernity and uh, the grammar of film. If you go back to the early 1900s, there was a preponderance of films being produced that essentially um, expressed or reflected the, uh, the public's uncertainty about modernity and about um, machines taking over work and lives. So you have films like Metropolis, you have films uh, like their goal, uh, especially from the German Expressionist uh, era. Um, but if we go back before that, to the early days of cinema, uh, the, the things that we watched were simply tableaus. There was no editing whatsoever. It was just a photograph with motion. Right? And that was because the inventors of the cinematographic camera were the first creators of media. It wasn't until... Uh, about 20 years after the inception, we've talked about this, the inception um, of cinema, black and white cinema, that the creators replaced the inventors. And that was when we started developing a grammar of film where, where the creators realized that the camera didn't have to sit in, that, in your seat to film the tableau before. So, I started with photography, as Bridget mentioned, and I became more fascinated. I became fascinated with the difference in school and in practice. I became really fascinated uh, with the difference between a photograph, which is a two-dimensional image, but what was film doing with 24 frames a second of photographs? So. What happens when we add motion to photography? What changes in terms of the aesthetics of the grammar of how we construct a story? Um, then you think about black and white cinema and the addition of color. And it wasn't until I was in grad school that actually the cost of color, film stock and developing, became less than the cost of black and white film. So incrementally, we added kind of a reality value to the proposition of film. Right? We started with just music and sometimes effects in the silent era, which is a misnomer. Uh, there was color in the silent era as well, through tinting or hand painting. So both black and white and the silent era are incorrect descriptors of what was happening, but essentially it was black and white. So in mid-70s, color became the expression of film. And it was a little bit closer to reality. 
in the theory, sound was added on film, so we had dialogue, so voice was heard. So incrementally, over the course of the history of film, we add little pieces of reality, making what we see more like what we perceive as we live. And I always was kind of depressed. Well, I was depressed for a lot of reasons, but um, I was upset when we had to produce our work in color. Because I thought the aesthetic separation was really, really important as an expressive tool, as, a, uh, uh, as part of the grammar of storytelling. So jump forward uh, 40, 50 years, and 55 decades. And I was at the Jacksonville uh, Wildlife Film Festival uh, four or five years ago, and uh, they had a virtual reality section. And I said, what's that? They said, oh, it's 360 degree filmmaking. And they had uh, a really great example from uh, Greenland, the melting, uh, Greenland melting. It was a production of Nova and Frontline, and you can find it on the screen. But they had a really cool, I don't even know what it was, but they had a little transponder. So if you wanted to go into a close-up of a glacier or a crevasse, you would like jump yourself there. Um, I really enjoyed it until I found myself in a helicopter, and I transpondered myself outside the helicopter, and I was looking down at the ocean and the glacier, and the person who was, you know, monitoring me actually had to catch me because I started to think I was falling. So it was really interesting. Yeah. So I thought that there was something really interesting about this 360 world that I was witnessing um, as it relates to the evolution of film and filmmaking with a whole new series of rules um, and, and possibilities. Uh, and editing in this does work. So um, through the Center for Environmental Filmmaking, we acquired a small little 360 uh, uh, camera. And I had a student, um, a, a senior, his name is Trent Burns, who was very interested also in this 360 degree world as it relates to documentary filmmaking. Um, and I'm gonna, we're working with, uh, on, on a pro hopefully we'll work on a project that looks at the impact of the immersiveness of this 360 degree world versus the two dimensional world when students who are not easily witnessing nature, they don't get to the forest, they're urban dwellers, and would the, will the impact of seeing a 360 degree world change their perception of either food or forest um, versus the two dimensional world. So um, Trent uh, filmed uh, over the summer of 2016 um, in the fall and um, produced a three, uh, 360 film except this is not in 360. It will actually switch when you, when you press play, it will switch to this mode. Oh, it will, okay. So um, he filmed it early, uh, at the Early Center where American University has um, a production farm. Um, and he interviewed a couple people and we just wanted to see what would happen when we mapped a two-dimensional plane in the three-dimensional world. And one of the biggest problems that we faced was how do you get people to turn their heads to see the person talking. We did not have surround sound that would have triggered, um, you know, hey, look here. Um, so Trent came up with a device that basically was just a graphical line. And he mapped the interviews on uh, 180 degrees away from one another. So whether you turn right to look or you turn left to look, you would find the person talking. So I'm just gonna do a very short uh, sample and I'll navigate very poorly with the mouse. And Trent was smart enough to give a little lead time to put your, you know, get your phones out, get ready to watch and watch. This is the early farm, the organic garden, a 25 acre plot in Fall. 
Fauquier County, Virginia. It's part of the Early Conference Center and was gifted to American University as part of a larger agreement in 2016. These fields, once used for grazing cattle, are being revitalized to supply DC area universities with a source of locally grown produce. You know, the area's always been known for their uh, um, raising of the cattle here on the So farm. if I turn left? Um, never have we done the garden aspect of it, like we're doing now. This is totally new, but this is for uh, vegetable garden, at least at this size. After selling off its cattle in the late 90s, Early left these fields unused for nearly 20 years. So I'm going to jump ahead. So he used uh, dissolves to, to move through. And, you know, given to people that don't have as much as we have. That was intense. So I just wanted to give you a quick example and keep it really short. It's primitive, uh, but it's really interesting. And I want to, you know, I'm using uh, the 360 world in my classes uh, currently because I think it's an important next step. Uh, for fiction and documentary uh, film. Uh, it's here or? No, it's here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> So hi, so um, my name is Bing Xiao, as Bridget introduced, I'm a assistant professor in computer science. So today I'm going to talk a little bit of science. I'm a scientist, I'm trained as a neuroscientist and currently a computer scientist, so I have a scientific motivation to use VR, AR. Also, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit more uh, than just vision, I'm actually focused primarily the current days on tactile. So that's a little different. So as a vision scientist, we know that we sense the world from all of these senses. We have our ear to hear, eyes to look, nose to smile, and, and hand to feel, and all sorts of senses. So in an ideal world of virtual or augmented reality, we want to take advantage of all of the senses, even though previous talks mostly focus on vision. So as you know, uh, we are really lucky as human beings to have this amazing sense of touch. So if you have a little kid like I, I do, um, you know that little kids, they, they love to touch everything. Um, that's why they love these cooking, uh, cooking experiments, they love pouring water, they love to see how things react when you touch them. Um, so the, our hands are actually really complicated. This is really the front end of both neuroscience, cognitive psychology, human-computer interface, and of course, including VR and AR, because there's complicated nerves going to the, uh, going through the hand, the fingertips. Um, so there's one famous experiment when you numb your fingertip and ask the observer to actually light up a mattress. It became super difficult. Just the fingertip, a little bit numbing, the person <coughs> cannot light up a match. So a simple task will not be able to, motor task will be able, not be able to do if you lose these nerves. So I'm not really, I just started to, to look into this field, so I'm not going to introduce all of these complicated physiology, but um, I'm just showing you a simple exper uh, scenario in my particular research. So as Bridget introduced, my research focused on how do we perceive material properties of objects. So for example, you walk in this room and there's chairs and there's table, you probably can predict <coughs> most of these things, how they feel by looking, right? You, you can look at this table, you, you know that's heavy, you sort of like fake wood, you know that's sort of smooth and gen gen genetically clean. Uh, there might be some transparent, sticky things, but 
without touching you sort of know. However, if this should be a video, but I think it became, oh yeah, it is a video. So on the other hand, if you could interact with this object like the glass um, with tactile um, fit force force feedback, you not know, you can also tell the subtle difference, such as it probably were made with glass instead of thin plastic. Okay, so this is sort of what I'm getting into. I want to use virtual reality and tactile device as a tool to understand how humans perceive material properties of objects with multiple senses. You can see that it's difficult to do with real objects. We cannot create a variety of different kind of glasses and ask many people to touch with incremental different type of forces. In VR, on the other hand, we could manipulate the visual information same times as tactile information independently and create uh, virtual um, situation. So, um, so to give you a little bit of concept, in particular, the, as Art mentioned, there is also sometimes a discrepancy between real world and vir virtual world. So one active research topic is how does the illusions we experience in reality transfer to virtual world? So for example, here is a um, famous um, illusion called material weight illusion. So two objects, uh, one look, heavier does it appear to be made with metal. Another one uh, appears to, to, to look lighter because it's made of um, um, polystyrene. So if you just by looking, everybody would agree the metal one looks heavier. However, the experimenter filled up the cubes so that the, the actual ground truth mass of these two objects the same. So they actually weigh the same if you dig them up. Well, the, the ground truth measurement of mass is the same. However, when observer leave this object up, they, are, they report the light-looking object to be heavier. So this is a famous illusion. I'm not going to explain to this. You can look it up on Google. There's bazillion papers about how to explain this. Some of them uh, involves your prior, mo how the motor uh, visually is um, calibrate the motor. So we wanted to basically study that in virtual tactile in the world. We, we want to know if we sort of mimic the situation with tactile force feedback, can we report, uh, can we repeat this result? So, what we have, yeah, is affect, how does visual appearance affect haptic judgment? I'll try to do this fast. It really is research. Uh, so what we have is, um, sorry, we have this um, device on the right. It's, 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 a, it's a device in the lab. I couldn't bring it to show because it's sort of expensive and you know, have to be level. But if you're interested, you are welcome to try it. So the observer manipulates the stylus. The stylus can output different amount of forces. However, in the virtual world, what they're seeing is that they're moving this cube from one place to the other. While they're moving using the stylus in reality like this, what they actually feel is different forces. So we can change the cube weight of the cube. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. But they, what they immersively see is this virtual cube in the virtual world. So, so in that way, what we can actually do is that we can manipulate the material properties of the cube at the same time as the output of the force. So that's what happens. Uh, and then, yeah, so we build this complicated device. So the one thing that you have to do is that people have to believe what they're manipulating in the real world is actually in the virtual world. You, you, you can just, if you don't do a great job, you can manipulate here, something there is moving, that's not working. So we have to align the sign of uh, sign of sign. You have to be carefully. We are lucky to have Jonas Newport helping me to build this um, build this device in the lab. So there's the line have to the side of this oak have to be calibrated. There's a projector on top and you are seeing this through a half silver mirror. So you can you can be fully immersed. So what we manipulated is the same as the material weight illusion. We have heavy looking cubes and light looking cube. This is a very basic, we, 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 this is, we should do more about this. This is just four different categorical materials, metal, uh, stone versus fabric, wood. I mean, there could be much better perfected by systematically changing uh, different <coughs> appearance. But this is what we did for this project. And then we asked people to do this task I just showed you, moving the cube from one place to the other. And what they are asked to report is how heavy the cube is. So every trial, the cube could be made with a very heavy force, also a very heavy looking material, or the, the cube can be made with a very light looking material, but have very light weight, or vice versa. So there's many, so the task is the observer moving, see the trial, 
they move the object, they place to the, the, the second placemat, and they pick it again. So one thing to notice, to, in order to pick up this object, you have to press a little button on this stylus. So they have to move the stylus, press the button, then it's like a magnet. They stack it up and um, move. So this is our task. So what we find as the result goes is that the heavier looking objects actually rated heavier. So this is the opposite from the material weight illusion. Basically, we didn't find material weight illusion in the setup. Um, so the, this is the physical mass, right? The physical mass means how much force output it is the technical device generate. So this, there is a systematic uh, relationship between the physical mass and perceived mass. And then once you add the material properties of the four categories of material property, you can see that they have an influence. That's why the systematic for each mass level, there's an influence of the appearance. So that's what we observe for across observers. And then uh, there are significant effects of these materials. Um, so the steel one, which is green, is rated heavier than the wood one or fabric one. So yeah, so, I, so that's the main effect. There are some other analysis one very interesting thing that we can actually do is this movement trajectory is completely recorded by the, the cube, the, the stylus. So you can not only just measure verbal report, you can also actually measure the, the, the motor response, which is that's why I love it so much. Because in a, usually in a psychophysical experiment, you do visual report how heavy it is. You know, you don't, it's like tracking eye movement. I'm tracking the stylus movement. So I then compute something like initial acceleration velocity, which I think the, the, the higher this velocity is, that people probably prepare to move this object mm -hmm. more heavy. So this action preparation is very important in how perception is used in action. So we also correlated, computed that. So <coughs> observer prepare stronger force to lift heavier looking objects. So that's our hypothesis. And then um, we notice only in the first lift, there is an effect of material properties. Only when the observer first interacts with the object, there is a diff the, the heavier looking object that uses stronger force. And this effect disappears for the second lift. This is actually also a, has an equivalent in reality called sequential material weight illusion. Somebody just published a paper in that. So that we can also continue on to explore all sorts of effects along this, uh, in this space of how material appearance, texture, and even dynamics influence our motor um, um, output and our judgment of material properties. So I'll end my little science talk here. So in the future, I'm actually writing a grant. So there are a few things I want to do. R suggests some amazing experiment of size evade illusion we're on the pipeline to do. Another thing is other haptic properties is only heaviness, how about st stickiness, elasticity, stiffness. That's much harder to do because then you have to render the object. Uh, deformable. So this actually proposed a lot of challenges in rendering too, right? So this, this has to be real time. All the virtual reality rendering poses challenges in computer graphics as everything has to be real time because the user interacts. So in order to deform an object, you have to do this fast, efficient. That alone has a, a lot of potential um, collaborative uh, opportunities as well. Another thing, there is other visual cues such as deformation and dynamics. How do we do a proper Q combination modeling. So e eventually, I want to actually model this process so I can predict in a newer situation what will happen. Um, so finally, if we have money and grant, it will be amazing to record eye movements and hands at the same time to understand how human manipulate objects in complex environment. So that's about the science part. The application of all of these tactile in virtual reality is immense, is immense too, it's huge. Uh, the most obvious one is robotic surgery. It's like you usually manipulate this. People probably already do this laps, laps, laparoscopic mm -hmm. surgery. Yeah, so you, you also need manipulate this stylus. And what happens in that, something happens um, remotely. So you need it to, in there, you need to know like how to prepare your visual cue with your motor output. But that's not what I, my research is. It's just a potential application. Um, and that you can also use as surgical practice that like, train people to like seal um, this piece of, I don't know what it is, like using the force feedback. So this is, will be much, much safer than try it on in a real patient. And then great for medical student <laughs> after exams. 
So yeah, the people already done that to a certain degree, but what is not known is that these perceptual phenomena, how to scientifically analyze the data, how to set up models. Uh, finally, this is a complete me. I talked to a new faculty in our um, department, Alex Godwin. When he was interviewed, we were talking about how to visualize data, this tactile um, dimension. But it, it may be too expensive to visualize data with tactile device because you can always just rotate it on the internet with some tools. But it would be nice that you could actually, um, you know, feel something that each material property dimension corresponding to certain property of the data, like certain mm -hmm. statistical property of your distribution data cloud. This is just my <coughs> idea. It's crazy. Um, not sure anybody. Welcome to conversations. No, no. This I have not really. I look a little bit in the internet. Nobody has really done that. So that's just uh, things. And there's something for you to think about, right? Uh, the first one is obvious. Um, Crystal has already said um, there's many applications, but really, can they really help us? Or they just entertain us and make us go into see shops? Can they really help us? Like make us go to one place to another faster, or make us happier, or help the older people, disabled people's lifestyle? And I'm really curious. This VR, AR thing is great. It's entertaining. It's fascinating. But can they, do we really need it? Right, that's a, if you can find this strong reason that we really need it, it's critically important, and then we win. We can win a lot of grants. And then finally, the last thing is, <laughs> last and the most, not the most, uh, least important is how can we help using this technology to help teaching, engaging our students. I can think of a variety of things, like if you want to feel what is like in Syria right now, right? You can't. You really want our elite undergraduate student to feel what it's like to live in a poor people's neighborhood. Maybe this can uh, provide some opportunity. All of these experts can help. So I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm a uh, little bit fast. And this is my student. Um, she cannot be here because she actually had a job interview with Magic Leap. We'll, we'll see. Oh, Finger yeah. crossed. And then Jonathan Newport is our fantastic mm -hmm. support in our building who build up the tech of device. And Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, um, Great. bye. <laughs> well, thank you, and thank you to all of you. So we only have a few minutes left, um, so I really will just ask one question um, for the panelists, the panelists, and then I encourage you to um, reach out to them by email, yes. and then also you know, try to corral them as you're walking over to lunch. There are lessos um, um, in the bowl. <laughs> exactly, exactly, We're right out there. Um, as well as invisible jets that you just want to get. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, but one, I, I know that one of the, probably the primary question that everybody has after listening to how these technologies are both varied and um, in both uh, method and use is how can we access them on campus? Are they accessible on campus? Where do we access them? How can we use them? I mean, if I am a philosophy professor and I suddenly want to study yeah. haptics and like the philosophy, how would I? How Just would I email about it. <laughs> so we are in. We are all except Larry, right? In the same building. Yeah. In the DMTI. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here and there. Oh, you're here and there. Sorry. What there building? What technology? Who has access to it? How can professors access it? How can uh, maybe we write to you and then you can send? I, it. I can uh, say that. So I, I, we just opened this VR lab, and I'm very open to any kind of collaborations. So anybody who wants to do a project in VR lab can just email me. Uh, we have equipment uh, available. Um, I have mainly the VR headsets and the work, uh, work, uh, uh, workstations, and uh, Bay has this amazing tactile. Um, feedback device, which is very expensive, $20,000 thing for experiments, but it's actually... Uh, I really want people to use it, because it's, it's too it's expensive to put in there. Yeah. And art has something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I have a VR. You have so I have the website should appear be appearing soon, but we have I have the laboratory for the study of perception, reality, and illusion, which is up in, and the goal is to make it, it's, I got a, it's a nice lab space, and I, my goal is to bring a lot of people into it, so if you would like to be if you're working on those issues and you would like to be part of that laboratory and, and want to have access to those space, please send me a note. We can, we can and he's the unity really expert. Yes. Yeah, and, and so then on, I mentioned this during my uh, little talk, but uh, I teach two classes. Um, Art oh, yeah. teaches it sometimes too. So it's uh, this class called CSE 121, which is creative coding. 
Um, you work in a kind of graphical environment. I believe arts um, I'll illusions. After you're done, I'll make the, I'll but make arts them. illusions were made in that that you saw, right? People yeah, the, the yeah. helix was done in, in, in some called So it, it hooks directly into these tools. And then also in the game development side, if you want to get through this kind of 3D immersive world. <coughs> um, and there's usually room in those classes. So tell your friends, so audit it, take it, whatever. <laughs> so can, can I give a pitch to this? There's yeah. a new class called CS121. <laughs> which is creative coding. It's undersubscribed right now, but it'll be in Q2 next year, and I'll be around. If you're interested in learning the basic techniques, if you have a program and you want to learn how to code, it is a fantastic course. Everyone should take it. And it basically teaches coding through creative experience. So instead of the standard course where you're starting with code, you make up a circle, and you learn how to manipulate the circle, and then you learn how to do these other parts. And by the time it's done, you can start making 3D stimuli and out of it. Um, the equipment room in the School of Communication has, I think, f five or six um, VR uh, 360 cameras. Um, they are essentially restricted to SOC, um, but through the Center for Environmental Filmmaking, we have uh, two that can be used if you're pursuing something that's related to uh, in environmental or wildlife uh, filmmaking, conservation. Um, it would be nice to consolidate and have more collaborative uh, work done based on the research that we we're talking about. But um, I don't know if there are other pockets that have 360 cameras on campus. But it I personally have, and I'm also open to, to use it by others, uh, personally meaning as a university, no. but not as a equipment room. So I have a very high quality 360 camera, which I can uh, can be used for projects if people are interested, including some of the recording, which is very important. We didn't talk about that. So just a quick follow-up. Um, given that so much of your work is interdisciplinary, are there any particular upcoming projects where it would be useful to say, like, hey, I'm looking for a humanities or a poli-sci professor to collaborate with um, on an upcoming project? Is there anything like that? No? Uh, well, the project that we've been talking about is that immersive um, differential between a 360 environment uh, impacting uh, public school kids or urban urban kids versus a photograph or two-dimensional um, experience and to see whether anything that we present to them in either domain has an impact on their perception of nature this is sort of com figuring out ways to co possibly combat uh, uh, nature deficit uh, disorder um, or syndrome um, um, and also to see if there's a way to use a 360 environment to change attitudes uh, about food oh. and nutrition um, so those are things I'm interested so in. Generally we, we uh, all the time reach out to other professors I just uh, emailed the chair of uh, audio technology um, and I'm working with another professor of psychology. So it happens all the time. Or we, or somebody approaches us, right? So we're basically very open to any kind of collaboration. And that's how it happens. It's usually uh, we he hear about some idea or we propose an idea and look for somebody to collaborate with. So it, it, it happens. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.